Good evening. Uh, welcome to a new webinar by NAPIC. Uh, this one is on special locations and is brought in association with the NAPIC Trade Association. Uh, my name's Paul Markham. I'm the Senior Training Lecturer at Mansfield. And I'm Dave Scully, Regional Inspections Manager for the North. Uh, there'll be time for questions at the end of the presentation, so please do feel free to, to uh, interact. Uh, the ask a question function button uh, is for most people in the right hand side of your screen uh, and we'll do our best as we can to uh, answer at the end of the presentation. Okay, you will, uh, you'll also find a full copy of the presentation in the handout section um, in the control panel along with a certificate of attendance which you can download for your uh, records. We will leave a couple of minutes at the end of the session to give you time to open and save this if you wish. Um, there will also be a short survey at the end of the webinar. Um, we would really welcome your feedback to make sure these webinars are as useful as possible. So we'll, we'll get started. Uh, just to warn you, there's a, there's a couple of polls. We always put a few polls in these things. Uh, there's a couple of polls, nice simple yes no answers in this one. Uh, uh, just for a little bit of audience participation. Thanks a lot, we'll start now. So, today's uh, seminar presentation is on special locations. Uh, as described in BSM 671, obviously, uh, but also to let you know that there is uh, an IET Guidance Note 7, which is on special locations to accompany the BSM 671. Okay, so let's consider why there is a separate part within BS 7671 regarding special locations. Now, the main reason for this is the presence of water and moisture, which mean additional precautions are necessary due to external influences, and also where there is an increased risk of electric shock. The, the first section uh, at the part of special locations in BSM 671 is section 701, locations containing a bath or a shower. It is the most common one that, that electricians do work in. Uh, please uh, be advised that although there is a special locations uh, part in the regs, that other parts of the regs also apply. These are bolt-on regulations and things like disconnection times, basic and fault protection, etc. should still be uh, taken into account. Okay, so before we uh, jump into the presentation, we basically just like to start with a quick poll. Simple yes or no answers. Um, and your first question is, can a socket outlet be installed in a location containing a bath or a shower? Martin, if you'd like to open the poll. Okay, so yes, evening everybody. Um, so, first quick poll of the day. Can a socket outlet be installed in a location containing a bath or a shower? Just shot through about 60% of you voting, 70%. Just give you a few more seconds, try and get everybody in there. It's a bit longer. Okay, um, I think we'll close the poll at that point. Right, we'll uh, go on with the next question. The answers will come straight after this this slide, by the way, and um, we'll go through the, the answers as well in detail through the rest of the presentation. Uh, can a plate light switch be installed in a location containing a bath or a shower? Simple yes or no. Over to you, Martin. Okay, so that's been launched now. Let's see a few more coming in. <coughs> We'll just allow a few more seconds to try and get up to 100% voting. Okay, and I think we'll close it at that. Okay, so the third question is, can a 230 volt fan be installed within zones 1 and 2? Over to you, Martin. Right, so that's been launched now. Uh, 
and TV voting. Good to see. Let's see if we can get up to 100% this time. Just allow a few more seconds. Okay, I think we're closer to that. And our last question in this short poll. Does a shaver point installed in a location containing a bath or a shower require additional protection by a 30 milliamp hour CD? Simple yes or no. Okay, so that's open now. Quite a few of you responding, which is good to see. So now a few more seconds. And okay, we'll close it that. Right, we'll go through some answers. Okay. Okay, so can a socket outlet be installed in a location containing a bath or a shower? And I see um, nearly near enough everybody got the answer to that question correct, and the answer is yes. And again, this will be discussed later within the presentation. Can a normal plate light switch be installed in a location containing a bath or a shower? Again, simple answer, yes. So, yeah. It was a bit split that one, 50-50 nearly. So yeah, you can install a plate light switch in a location, bath or shower. We'll explain a little bit more later. Okay, and the third question: Can a 230 volt fan be installed within zones one and two? Again, it was very much split on the answer to this question, and the answer again is yes, you can. Um, and once again, fans will come up. Uh, later within this presentation. The last question, obviously, the shaver point. Uh, again, uh, majority got the answer, which is yes. Uh, again, because the, the cable is installed within a room containing a bath or a shower, the cable itself needs to be protected by a 30 milliamp hour CD. Yeah. Bathrooms themselves uh, are split into zones. If you have a look in, in 701 of the regs, you'll see it's all in zones. The zones themselves uh, are where you need to install certain equipment to certain IP codes. Zone zero is the actual interior of the bathtub or the shower basin along its entire length. Uh, and therefore, a shower tray would mean your feet and the soles of your feet up to your ankles are just in zone zero. Zone one goes around the bath, full length of the bath, full width of the bath, and is up to a height of 2.25 metres from the floor, floor level, or the water outlet, whichever is the highest. Uh, and zone two is 0.6 of a metre on the boundary of zone one, and as you can see from the wavy line, it follows the, the kidney shape of the, of the bath. Uh, and 0.6 of a metre, of course, is arms reach, roughly, uh, and anything outside 2.25 metres and outside zone 2 is, is taken as outside the zones. Okay, so IP ratings then. So IP ratings are discussed quite frequently throughout the electrical trade. Um, and your IP ratings are classified really as follows. So your first number is referring to protection against against access to hazardous parts and protection against the ingress of solid objects. So in a location containing a bath or a shower, the classification would be X, which is protection unspecified. Now your second number, this refers to protection against water ingress. Therefore, zone zero would be classified as IPX7 which is protection against temporary immersion. Now, any equipment installed within zones one and two would require a minimum protection to IPX4, which is protection against splashing from all directions. Here's a list of uh, examples of equipment that uh, electricians install within locations containing a bathroom shower. Uh, as you can see, 
fairly extensive and, and most people will have installed a lot of these things. You'll see that two thirds of the way down the list is the socket outlets one. Uh, can they be installed in location? Yes, they can. Uh, they are probably the, are the only ones on there that would not require to be installed in the zones. Now, that's, that's the only thing. The others, as long as you've got the correct IP rating, uh, read the manufacturer's packaging for certain zones, then yeah, they, they can probably go in the zones. Okay, so electric showers then. So, now an electric shower can be fitted inside zone one. Now, it must have additional protection by a 30 milliamp RCD, and it must also have a minimum rating of IPX4. Now, when installing a shower, local isolation would need to be provided either by a suitably rated switch or a pull cord. A pull cord may be installed within zones, however a switch must be installed outside of zone. Uh, this is the ventilation fans uh, discussion point. Uh, again, this, this was split. We asked the question, can a 230 volt fan be uh, put in zone 1? And the answer is, yes, it can. Again, it has to be IPX4, manufacturer's instructions on the packaging. Uh, if you're going to use a self fan, and it doesn't have to be self, but if you're going to use a self fan, then the transformer obviously has to be installed outside the zones or in roof voids, things like that. Uh, and also, uh, it's not a, an electrical regulation, the, the third point, it's a building regulation, but in a, a room or a room containing a battery shower that hasn't got uh, any natural light coming in from a window, then building regs have stated that there should be an isolator for the fan to enable the fan to be worked on uh, while we are uh, still in full artificial light. Okay, so light fittings. So again, there is a little bit of confusion out there with regards to fitting a 230 volt light fitting within a uh, bathroom. Now, a 230 volt fi fitting may be installed in zones so long as again it meets the IPX rating for. Uh, it must also have um, additional protection via a 30 milliamp RCD. So. When fitting a light outside of zone, there are actually no special requirements, so long as it is suitable for the area it is to be fitted and that it cannot be affected by external influences. Uh, and that's why these, the fitting of accessories and the question of a plate switch came up earlier on in the poll. Uh, a plate switch again is IP2X to be quite honest. Uh, and therefore doesn't comply with IPX4, uh, must be fitted outside of the zones, but could be fitted outside the zones as long as other external influences are taken into account. As you can see from the slide, we're talking about moisture running down the walls, excessive steam and the likes. A, a large uh, room containing a bath or a shower, such as a, a large bedroom with a shower cubicle in the corner, could itself have a uh, a plate switch near the door, uh, nobody can get any problems from it, the external influences can affect it. Uh, of course, it must be protected again by a 30 milliamp hour CD, uh, and the picture shows a, a large bedroom of, of something like that type. Sockets, if they are in a room like this, must be at least three meters away from the edge of zone one, which is the edge of the bath, the edge of the shower tray. Uh, and of course it's a socket and it's in a bathroom so it must have a 30 milliamp RCD on it. Uh, again we get questions sometimes on the technical outline uh, stating you know if, if I've got a socket and I use an IP56 socket can I put it closer to the shower or the bath than the three meters allowed? The, the answer simply to that one is no. You do have to comply with the regs and the regs states that no socket outlets, whatever the IP rating, can go within three meters of zone one. Okay, so before we carry on with this uh, presentation, we do have a, another little poll for you. 
Um, again, simple yes or no answers. Uh, so essentially, the question is, which of the following are special locations or installations? So the first location we have is a domestic garden. Okay, so that falls been launched on your screen now. So is a domestic garden a special location? Had a few answers so far. A few more seconds on that one. Plenty of response. And closing it now. Next question. Would you find a caravan as a special location? as defined by BS7671, yes or no? Okay, so that's been launched on your screens now. Quite a few of you revolting. I'll just give you a few more seconds. And closing it now. Okay, so the third area is it a special location? A kitchen. Okay, so is a kitchen a special location? A few people vote in. Just give it a few more seconds. And closing the poll now. And lastly, a detached garage. Would you classify this as a special location or not? Okay, so that's been launched on your screens now. Just a few more seconds. Right, I'll close the poll now. Right then, for some answers. Uh, domestic garden. Uh, most people, uh, in actual fact, said it was, uh, and to be quite honest, it, is, it isn't a special location. It doesn't come under BS7671 in that respect. Obviously, you've got to take into account that whatever goes outside needs to be protected. It would need additional protection by an RCD if you are plugging things in the sockets. And, of course, equipment out there would have to comply with a high IP code to take into account the adverse weather conditions and external influences, but it's not a, a special location. No. Okay, so the second location we gave you was a caravan. And looking at the results of the poll, the majority of people um, were correct in their answer for that. So is a caravan a special location? And yes, it is. Um, now, we will be discussing um, a caravan as special locations later within the presentation, so you'll get some more information regarding that. Kitchens. Uh, yeah, the poll's very good on this one. Most people uh, agreed that a kitchen isn't a special location. It isn't, no. Uh, some confusion still reigns due to the fact that Part P, uh, uh, an older version of Part P, did make a kitchen a special location and therefore things had to be notified when work was done there. Uh, the Part B document was upgraded and updated to, to be relevant to what BS7671 is. The kitchen was never a, a special location in BS7671, so it was deleted from Part P, and, and no, it's correct, it isn't a special location. Okay, and the final poll then, so is a detached garage classed as a special location? Uh, quite near enough everybody um, correctly answered that question and essentially no it's not a special location um, it never has been and I don't think it ever will be so with that we'll uh, move on to the presentation and the reason for that was obviously the, there is a list in front of you now of, of the special locations uh, the most common one, of course, is at the top, the bath and shower. Uh, as you can see from the, the red highlighted sections on the side, some of the numbers are, are not concurrent. They don't follow suit. There is spaces for additional uh, special locations to be included in, in later versions 
of the regulations. We are not going to um, look at each one of them in turn, but we are going to pick out a few that most people will be uh, involved with. Okay, so the first special location we're going to discuss is within section 702 of the regulations, and that is swimming pools and other base, basins. Now, again, like uh, areas containing a bath or a shower, there are prescribed zones within this. Now, zone zero, which is the interior of the basin, um, if you were to install any equipment within this zone, it should be a minimum IPX rated. Now, such equipment would involve uh, pool lighting, things like that, which, as you know, is con completely immersed, so would need the appropriate uh, protection. Zone 1, which is 2 metres from the rim of the basin and up to a height of 2.5 metres. Now, any equipment that is installed within Zone 1 shall be to a minimum IPX4 or IPX5 rated and that's in the event of water jets being used for cleaning purposes. Okay and Zone 2 is 1.5 metres external to Zone 1. Now you can see a little note there as well that states there are no Zone 2 for fountains. If you were to install equipment to Zone 2, um, if it was for a indoor swimming pool, you would be looking at IPX2, or for outdoor, IPX4. And once again, in the event that any water jets are used for cleaning purposes, um, then a minimum of IPX5 should be used. So, Zone 2, essentially, you can supply equipment within the zone so long as it is self or automatic disconnection of supply with RCD or there is electrical separation. Okay, so where a PME supply is used, it is recommended that a earth electrode with a resistance of 20 ohms or less is installed and connected to the protective equipotential bonding. Okay, so section 703, which is rooms and cabins containing sauna heaters. Okay, so zone 1 is classified as a distance of 0.5 metres from the surface of the heater and from floor to ceiling level. Only the sauna heater and any um, directly linked equipment is to be installed within this zone. Okay, and zone 2. Now, this runs from the edge of zone 1 to the cold side of the thermal wall and to a height of one metre from the floor level, floor level. Now, as you can see, um, there are no uh, special requirements regarding heat resistance for any equipment to be installed within this zone. Now, zone three. Now, this is the area that runs from the edge of zone one and above the one metre height of zone two up to the ceiling level. Now, only equipment capable of withstanding temperatures of up to 125 degrees and cables capable of withstanding temperatures up to 170 degrees should be installed within this zone. Please also be aware that um, any equipment that is installed should also have a minimum IPX4 rating. Moving on to uh, section 704. Again, a lot of us work on construction, demolition sites, uh, and again, we need power for equipment uh, to travel around that site. Any socket outlets, any handheld equipment, up to 32 amps has to be protected uh, by reduced low voltage, which means the 110 volt site transformers and distribution gear that's available on site. You can use automatic disconnection of supply with a 30 milliamp RCD. 
uh, but with restrictions depending on the, the contractor on site. You can use electrical separation and of course there is the advantage of also solvent pellets being used. Any socket outlets and any equipment, larger cement mixes and the likes that's over 32 amps must have a minimum of a 500 milliamp RCD on it uh, and like a lot of special locations and installations you'll find that PME uh, should not be used on the site. Uh, TT, TNS, no problem. Uh, PME only if uh, extraneous conductive parts are reliably connected to the main earthing terminal and a competent electrician is on site to make sure that it can be tested at very frequent intervals. Uh, section 705 which is agricultural and horticultural premises. So all installations on agricultural or horticultural premises, no matter what type of earthing system is used, should have the following disconnection devices. So any circuits with socket outlets equal to, equal to or less than 32 amp should be protected by a 30 milliamp RCD. Any circuits with socket outlets greater than 32 amp shall be protected by a uh, 100 milliamp RCD. And any other circuits um, in, in the area should be protected via a 300 milliamp RCD. Now, in locations intended for livestock, then supplementary bonding shall connect all exposed conductive parts and any extraneous parts that are accessible to livestock. A lot of questions received, uh, especially during the summer months, I must admit, on the technical outline uh, regarding uh, installations in caravan and camping parks. Again, uh, the the regulations goes into the, the fact that PME should not be used, uh, only TT and TNS systems for the, for the hookup points. The hookup points themselves uh, need to be have a, have a high rating, external influence rating, that's what the AD4, AE2 and AG3 codings are above there, available in Appendix uh, 5 of the regs. Uh, all of the hookup points you'll find uh, need a, a connection point to a BS60309-2 industrial commando socket unit, uh, two IP44 and a minimum of, of 16 amps. Each individual socket has to be protected by its own RCD and its own overcurrent protection. The, the RCDs, RCBOs that are on there also need to be uh, a minimum of double pole for single phase equipment. All live conductors need to be broken, uh, not just a single pole device. Heights are relevant because obviously you get a lot of mud and splashes around the um, the caravan hookup point, especially uh, in this country. Um, the distance from the hookup point to the caravan can be a maximum of 20 meters, which uh, to me always seems a little bit far far but that's that's what it states uh, and once again we've already mentioned PME should not be used only used for the fixed site buildings such as the reception area the the on-site shop uh, the utilities there but uh, the, the hookup ET or TNS uh, very similar in a way is marinas because a marina obviously is really a caravan park with the caravan packed on water uh, the, the external influence codes can be a little bit higher. Obviously, you've got maybe salt water instead of fresh water. You have waves uh, caused by the boats coming in, so the external influences are higher. The hookup points themselves are very similar in respect to the caravan park. Uh, again, commando plug and top socket 60309 assemblies, uh, this time up to 63 amps, but still generally 16 amps, IP44. Heights change because of, of waves and the likes, uh, but the important thing of course at the end is that again PME not to be used. The, the marina pontoons and the likes should be uh, 
different earthen arrangements uh, and TT is, is probably the best one for these types of installations. Okay, so section 717, mobile or transportable units. Now, this section applies to mobile vehicles and transportable containers and cabins such as catering units. Um, please where that additional guidance is available in BS 7909 uh, temporary, electrical in temporary Electrical Systems. Now, all such installations require a automatic disconnection of supply via a 30 milliamp RCD. Now, in accordance with regulation 717411312, all accessive conductive parts, such as the structure, shall be connected by the main bonding conductor direct to the main earthing terminal within the unit. Uh, and once again, the use of PME is only permitted if the installation is continuously under the supervision of a skilled person and the effectiveness of the earth is confirmed before connection. Okay, so 721, which is electrical installations in caravans and, and motor caravans. Now, as you can see there, the AC side of the installation is not to exceed... 230 volt, 400 volt dependent, and the DC side is not to exceed 48 volt as per 721.1. You can also refer to Annex A721 at the end of, seven, of section 721 within BS 7671. The caravan itself uh, has several uh, important regulations attached to it. Uh, the first thing is that, again, the hookup point uh, being external needs to be IP44 to BS EN60309-2 commando plug and socket arrangements. No more than 1.8 metres from the ground. Obviously, we don't want people climbing on ladders and steps and chairs to try and trying to connect these things up. Uh, it should be accessible and a supply cable fixed that is 25 metres long. Uh, that 25 metres enables everybody to get to the hookup, which is a maximum of 20 metres away, taking into account snaking, etc. Within the, the caravan unit itself, there needs to be an appropriate consumer unit distribution board containing a main switch disconnector, RCDs, appropriate protective devices, and again, single pole RCBOs are not permitted. They should be a minimum of double pole uh, and of course brake hole life conductors. Uh, as you can see just below the caravan there, there should be a notice stating how to connect it to the site supply. Not everybody in a caravan is an electrician uh, and therefore there should be a notice explaining how to do it. If they do it in any other way than what is explained, then they take responsibility for that. Installation cables should be stranded to take into account the flexing of, of the unit as it travels down the road. Uh, a minimum of 1.5, again to give it a little bit more strength, one mils are a little bit too small and can snap easily. Uh, there needs to be a PC installed throughout. All should be supported to make sure it flexes A-OK. -okay. Uh, minimum clipping distances uh, are available there. Any lighting luminaires within the, the caravan itself should be preferably fixed direct. Uh, any pendant should have some type of hook arrangement to make sure it doesn't uh, smash the, the lamp in transit. Uh, and as stated before by Dave on the, on the portable equipment and the mobile equipment, uh, accessible metallic parts including A-frame if necessary, uh, protected uh, and connected to the main protective bonding conductor, preferably by a multi-stranded uh, cable to take into account flexing. And there's a special section uh, in there to make sure that cables don't go through liquid petroleum gas cylinders, cupboards, etc. Uh, and the last one we're going to cover uh, is electric vehicle charging installations. Uh, fairly new uh, and also a new technology that is is increasing in, in its use out there. 
Uh, as you can see from the top right hand corner, you'll find there is a, an IET code of practice for this type of thing. There's also a, a City and Guilds exam that a lot of, of members are actually taking here at the training centre. It's the City and Guilds 2919. Uh, it does involve a dedicated circuit. It has to be its own uh, separate circuit. No diversity is allowable on that circuit and it would either be a a 16 amp or a 32 amp supply. Uh, because the units are generally outside, obviously they will be manufactured to the required IP codes. Uh, the main thing is also that an RCD is required. And as it says there, at least an A type. An A type is AC responsive uh, and has to be at least that. Uh, depending on the manufacturer of the of the care of the of the inverters uh, and everything else, it, it may require a B-type RCD because if the DC component exceeds 6 milliamps and this is available from manufacturer's literature, then a B-type uh, RCD would need to be fitted as this detects faults on the DC side as well. Uh, B-types obviously have a higher cost involved. Uh, any socket outlets and connectors have to be to the required standard explained in the code of practice. Heights um, to adhere to building regulations um, but also in there is a very important part on the special precautions needed for PME conditions uh, and again uh, a large section of the document and a large section of the exam is taken up with how to uh, risk assessment PME conditions. Okay, so I'd like to thank you all for logging in for this webinar. Um, I'm going to spend a bit of time now answering or <laughs> trying to answer any questions you may have. Okay, so thank you guys. Um, we've had a few questions um, going on throughout the webinar. Um, and I'll, I'll ask a couple um, together if that's okay, because they kind of lead on from each other. So early on we had Ivan asking what special rules apply to down lights in zones one and two and sort of coming in line with that Cliff has also asked are non-IP related 12 volt down lights suitable for installations within a bathroom area? 12 volt um, extra low voltage down lights are, are available uh, and can be used within a bathroom area uh, they because of their, their 12 volts uh, the secondary side um, itself doesn't need an RCD, but the primary side and the transformer supply would. Uh, the only thing that you have to be aware of with the, um, the installation of extra low voltage lights within uh, a bathroom is to make sure that you get the, the proper IP codes, uh, especially if they're in low ceilings, they would need to be at, at least IP um, X4. Uh, if it's in a high ceiling and directly above the shower, you then have to take into account the, the external influences that the light fitting could, could encounter, steam, moisture, uh, and although there's no specific IP code, that would be up to the uh, competent person on site to check uh, what external influences are going to affect that fitting uh, and install one appropriately. Okay, so thank you. Um, I think your microphone went off towards the start of that, guys. So are you, are you okay to just recap the, the first little bit? Yeah, um, I can recap it again if I, I can I remember. Didn't hear it from, yeah, the yeah, no problem. Yeah. That on that. yeah, no problem. Extra, extra low voltage light fittings can actually be installed in bathrooms. Yeah, what you've got to be aware of is is that the the external influence codes uh, and the IP codes need to be adhered to. So if you're putting a, a light fitting and it's, and it's a fairly low light fitting uh, and in the zones, uh, then it would need to be at least IPX4, uh, that's the required. Any fitting installed above 2.5 meters and therefore outside zones has to just adhere to the rest of the regulations and the rest of the regulations simply states external influences you've got to make sure that whatever affects that light fitting in the position you put it can't damage it. So steam, high moisture, uh, and if that, that's present then you, you would need a, a light fitting that is um, of a higher IP code. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. 
Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, apologies if people had already heard that, but it just didn't come through on my PC, so I wanted to make sure that everybody got the answer. Um, so, Jeff has also asked, um, what are the differences between special locations in BS7671 and special locations in Part P? No, there isn't one really. Part P obviously is a different, a different document to, to BS7671. BS7671 should be used for all electrical installations. Part P of the building regulations is just one of the building regulations uh, and really states that certain installations, brand new circuits, uh, any alterations such as consumer unit changes, rewires, need to be notified to building control so a building compliance certificate can be raised for them. Uh, the, the only special location within Part P is the, um, the, the room containing a bath or a shower, location containing a bath or a shower, uh, because it's obviously the most common one within the domestic environment. Uh, and obviously, if things are installed in there correctly, then people's lives can be uh, put at risk. Yeah. No. Like, like we discussed at the beginning with the special locations, it's due down to an air room containing bath or shower, uh, there's more risk of electric shock in there, moisture ingress, so they, they want to be sure that it, it, the work is done correctly. Okay, great. Thank you, guys. Um, one from um, Martin. He's asking, would outdoor lighting in a garden come under section 714 as a special location? Mm -hmm. Outdoor lighting um, in itself is not a special location. The, um, the supply to it would probably be best on an RCD. The, um, the external influences would come under manufacturing instructions basically for it. Uh, lighting fixed to the outside of a building uh, isn't a special location. It would just be added to uh, and in addition to the existing lighting circuits within the house. Okay, thank you. Um, just one from Wayne now. Um, where does a hot tub installed outside come within special locations? <laughs> Comes under other basins, yeah, seven, 702, section 702, other basins. Uh, so it comes on the swimming pools, really. Uh, that section should be read in conjunction with that uh, and to be quite honest probably entails again like David said earlier on with the with the special location that um, that, uh, that an earth rod would be put in, earth electrode put in uh, and um, uh, a low ohmic value of about 20 ohms tested and checked to make sure it was is A-OK -okay for that. Okay so uh, one from Michael then. Um, if installing a shower and using an RCBO to protect the circuit in a non-RCD protected board, should I also be required as part of the job to also fit an RCBO for lighting circuit in order I can in order so I can tick item 10 on the schedule of inspections? It depends if you're working on the lighting circuit, really. Um, obviously, if you are working on the lighting circuit, then you would be responsible for ensuring it complies with 7671. If you were simply there to install a shower or replace a shower, then you could put it down as an observation that there's no RCD protection, but you are, you're not under any obligation to ensure that it's RCD protected if, if you're not working on it. Yeah, on your certification for, for the shower install, whether it's a replacement minor works or whether it's a, a full shower installation, uh, you should advise the customer that an RCD should go on the existing lighting circuit, uh, and and that's all you can do. Well, again, NAPIC does do what we, we do do a dangerous situations report book, which could be ideal in this sort of instance where you're working on a circuit, you no notice something that's potentially dangerous. Obviously, customers don't always want to pay out extra money. You could record this, you sign it, customer signs it, both keep a copy and it, essentially you're covered in the event of something should happen. Okay, thank you. Um, Barry is now asking, um, 
is supplementary bonding required if RCD protected in a bathroom? Hmm. Yeah, good question. <laughs> is it best to put it in? Obviously, it would be. Uh, and if it's there, let it remain. Um, it, it's one of those things that the regs actually states. The state it actually states that supplementary bonding within a room container, a bath or shower is required and then it goes and contradicts itself and says it can be omitted if and there are sort of three criteria that you must meet one is that there's an RCD on every circuit feeding that location so on the shower, the immersion heater, the lighting uh, if required uh, that protective equipotential bonding is in place on the water pipes feeding that location and that the, the pipe work is continuous and therefore needs a, an R2 check uh, with your, your test instrument. As long as you can hit all of those three requirements, then supplementary bonding isn't required, no. Okay, so um, one from Angus now. Um, are there any particular conditions where cell with adequate IP rating would be preferable to 240 volt AC fittings with suitable IP rating? It's always safer. Solve is is a is a protective measure. Uh, the voltage cannot rise to a potential where where it will will hurt somebody. So, uh, solve is always the best option to two thirty volts, most definitely. But, yeah. Again, risk assessment mm -hmm. be best option. Yeah, uh, what the customer is willing to pay and what they want. Yeah. And, and yeah. Okay. Um, I think that pretty much covers all the questions we've received. Um, apologies if I've missed any. Um, you can obviously call our guys on the tech team um, using the, the general APIC number and then using the options for the tech guys. So if, you, if we have missed any, I apologize and by all means just get in touch. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for, for listening. Yeah, thanks for your attendance again. Um, hope to do another one soon. Yep, yeah, and uh, we hope you've uh, managed to get something out of this presentation. And um, okay, yeah, thanks for attending. Thank you. Cheerio. Thank you. Bye. Bye.